I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not-so-typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcasts, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hello, friends. I'm Effie Parks. Once a month, I release this extra special episode in a series I call A Rare Collection. It features a few people from the rare disease community, each telling a true story with the same theme. I'm super excited to present the 15th episode in the storytelling series. I can't believe it. I've always been moved by storytelling, and I believe there is so much power in them for both the listener and the storyteller. I'm the luckiest podcaster ever in that this is what I get to do for fun, passion, and purpose. Today's episode features three rare mamas. The theme of the show for today is easier said than done. The storytellers have the utmost freedom to be creative and take the theme wherever their heart desires. Here's a story from rare mama Katie Stevens, executive director over at Team Telomere. Hi, my name is Katie Stevens. I'm a rare disease mom, advocate, and the executive director of Team Telomere. Today, I want to tell you a story about what was easier said than done. It's back to school season and it got me thinking about the education system and how it so often fails the most vulnerable children. In 2015, we moved from Idaho to Boston. My son Riley was set to be the sixth in the world to undergo a clinical trial for people with telomere biology disorders. We had been searching for the best course of treatment for Riley for three years. Riley's body was no longer able to fight any virus or infections. He couldn't stop bleeding and he didn't have enough red blood cells to keep him from feeling winded when we walk just a block or two. This made our day-to-day choices extremely difficult. His day-to-day was one that was riddled with worry of what he could be exposed to and what ifs. What if he falls and hits his head? What if some kid bumps him too hard in the hallway? What if there's flu or strep going around? I cannot even imagine going through the COVID pandemic. He was a 12 year old little boy who only wanted to be quote unquote normal. And his body made it so he couldn't be a part of anything social, especially school. Upon moving to Boston, we had a plan with our local school district. Yep, we had our 504 in place. Yep, we had had an at-home teacher. We knew that all we needed was our school district to sign paperwork to grant Boston permission to give him a tutor. No cost to the school district. We just needed a signature. Did that happen? Nope. Did I fight it? Yep. Did I win? Mm, Kind of. Did it break me? Yes. I could travel 3,000 miles for treatment, leaving behind my husband and children. And it was the education system that broke me. Getting your child an education while they are critically ill or disabled is much easier said than done. Everyone forgets that there are 24 hours in a day, that treatment or travel is such a small part of that day, that there are endless minutes where there is nothing to fill them with. I can't tell you how many times I heard, he just needs to focus on getting better. The problem with this statement is you are no longer giving access to a child who is not choosing to be absent from school. You are not granting moments of learning in a time when his mind wants to be busy with anything other than the hospital room. You're denying him the same learning and experience, even if it's virtual, as his peers. Video games, child life, and Lego sets are great distraction, but soon lose their sparkle. In the end, we crawled (laughs) by our fingernails across the finish line that is graduation. 
I am so thankful for the hero teachers and education liaisons that stepped in and stood up for Riley and frankly for me, but it shouldn't have been that hard and it shouldn't continue to be this hard. Education for the most vulnerable of our society shouldn't be dismissed and it shouldn't be easier said than done. It just needs to get done. Here's a story from Double Rare Mama, Parvathy Krishnan, and Foundation Alliance Manager over at Global Genes. As a child, I was always told growing up, nothing was impossible, that everything would be okay if I just saw the positive. I truly believed the ups and downs of life were a part of the journey, and all I had to do was see the positive. When I had my first child, I had this whole parenting journey mapped out. I knew there would be ups and downs, but boy, was I naive. I had envisioned this journey to have some bumps, but I did not expect this journey to be filled with potholes, car crashes, and train wrecks that happened every few feet. It was hard to see the positive when everything seemed bleak. Through our diagnostic odyssey, through various aggressive treatments concurrently taking place for both our children with rare diseases, it was hard to find the positive. Most days, we felt like we were failing like hope, was a mirage. As a family caring for two children with rare and ultra-rare diseases, it was pretty hard to find the positive to this journey. Isolation was our trademark. With every diagnosis, we were told, we don't know any other child who has all of this individually or as a whole. That hurt. That felt like a punch in the gut. It was hard to find the positive. To this day, we remain one of the few rare families who have had more than one rare disease concurrently between both children. As of today, our son remains the only person in the world known to us with his disease-causing genetic mutation. While it has all felt impossible, it has all felt difficult to live through, our children have shown us resilience beyond what we've ever seen or learned. Over the past 10 years of living our rare life, I realize that I was not waiting just for a medical breakthrough to happen, but I felt like that would be the only positive that would give me closure. Boy, was I wrong. Once again, what really made our day better was a smile from our children, a smile that made our pain go away and that made us all bright and cheery. That was the positive that we needed. As our son grew older, more than ever he has shown us to see the positive in everything. While it has been anything but easy on him, he has always reminded us that it could be a lot worse. Two weeks ago, we were traveling for his medical care. We often consolidate a lot of appointments. We move mountains to ensure the dates align and everything is squared away. This time around, we were all so eager to get his medical procedures out of the way so he could start school without having to worry about missing too many days right away. We saw so many positives. Success in getting these scheduled, traveling without cancellations, and so on. After our first full day of tests and procedures, it was then that we found out that due to some unavoidable hiccups, all of his planned tests and procedures for the week were going to be canceled. As a mom, I was angry, frustrated, and just upset that our best laid plans were tossed away. It was in the middle of pure chaos while I was planning our trip back that my teenager looked over to me and said, it's not all that bad, you know. I only had one day of GI prep. I am so glad they told us the procedure was being canceled before you had to do further interventions in preparation for this test. All in all, I'm glad they told us when they did and saved us all the trouble. While I knew he had endured a tough two days of tests, procedures, and prep, I was truly shocked and thankful he could see the positive in all of this. It was then I was reminded of my favorite quote by Albus Dumbledore. Happiness can be found even in the darkest of times, if one only remembers to turn on the light. While it is easier said than done to find the positive, even when it feels impossible, just remember to turn on the light and hope that this too shall pass. Here's a rare story from Rare Patient and Double Rare Mama. Beck Tilly, representing Coolin de Vries syndrome. Easier said than done. I'm sure all of us in our life have heard that at least once. And I'm also sure all of us can relate to that. Because it's always easier to say something than to do it. 
am a really passionate writer and advocate. And in all of the articles and blogs I've written, you'll see the line either heading it or probably two lines into it saying, celebrate your uniqueness, be yourself, enjoy being you. And as wonderful as that sounds, in real life, that's extremely challenging to do. And I'm speaking from experience, both as a child and as an adult. The symptoms for Coulin de Vries syndrome that myself and my two youngest share can vary across the board from mild to moderate to severe. And two of the symptoms are developmental delay and mild to moderate intellectual disability. I grew up with learning difficulties all through school. I had this problem and I was made to feel like it was a problem because of my peers. I was a really easy target for bullies because compared to them, I didn't fit in. I didn't belong. And they also caused a few teachers a lot of frustration, given how long it took me to learn. So this was something that I never achieved growing up as a rare individual. I never learned what it was to love and to celebrate what made me different to everybody else. And this is something I really want for my own beautiful children who are growing in their own uniquely wonderful way. They both have hypotonia and are both absolutely thriving. And I like to think that part of that is down to that I encourage them every single day. I call out the good, the great and the beautiful and who they are. Talk about their strength, their beauty, the fun that they are. Just everything I can think of that makes them beautiful, that makes them unique, I celebrate it. And most of all, their progress. I want them to know how strong they are. I want them to be empowered in who they are, even though it's not like everyone else, even for the reason they're not like everyone else, because that is their superpower. It's who they are. It's their own little light letting it shine. As a kid, I did this. And the reception I got for it was shocking. And it's a reception I would never want for my own children. But at the same time, there is nothing I want more for them to belong, for them to feel confident and strong and secure in who they are. And for me to achieve that, I need to be the example to them, especially as a mama who shares the same syndrome as they do. I feel a responsibility to them to be that example of what it is to celebrate being unique. And I find doing that through being an advocate, through my own rare disease diagnosis, discovering that I'm genetically different to most people at the age of 37, I finally had a reason to embrace what makes me different and to no longer begrudge myself for not being normal like everyone else. It was and has been and continues to be the most amazing opportunity to show the world what it is to celebrate being you, what makes you you. And there's definitely a price to pay for that. It's empowering and liberating to say this is me and stand strong and be true to who you are and follow your calling and not be buried by social norms on how people think you should be, but actually stand up to have your voice to express yourself in the way that is true to you, which is what I deeply want for my children. It's not comfortable and it's not easy, which I believe is why so many fit in. They want to blend in with the crowd because standing out, it's not going to be long before someone comes around <laughs> and tries to put you in your place. I know that for me to tell my family, my friends, the rare community in the world, this is who I am and this is what I stand for, has not been an easy journey. There's people that celebrate and support that with me and that value who I am and what makes me one of a kind. And there's those that have questioned, doubted and judged it. And I'm sure my children will encounter exactly the same thing. So there is no doubt that saying be yourself is way easier than doing it because you're taking a stand. You're standing out and saying, this is me. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. And I believe that as a rare community and rare individuals, especially for our children, that they have a right to shine. They have a right to belong. And most of all, to be who they truly are.
And I believe it's for us as their parents to be an example of that, to dare ourselves to go before them and to let our light shine, to be who we uniquely are, to speak, act and live in the way that is true to us so we can inspire our children to do just the same. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate you all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you. Ha, 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 ha.